to the square of the distance. This machine does the calculating. These particles bouncing. Only trouble with it is that it doesn't work <laughs> for other reasons. Every theory that you make up has to be ag analyzed against all the possible consequences and to see if it predicts anything else. And this predicts something else. If the Earth is moving this way, more particles will hit it from the front than from the back. If you're running in the rain, more rain hits you from the, in the front of the face than in the back of the head because you're running into the rain. And so as the Earth is moving in this direction, it's running into the particles, rather, and running away from the ones that are chasing it from behind, so that more particles hit it from the front than from the back, and there would be a force also sideways whenever there was any motion. This sideways force would slow the Earth up in the orbit and certainly would not have lasted the at least three, four billion years that it has been going around the sun. So that's the end of that theory. Well, you say that was a good one, though. It got rid of the mathematics for a while. Maybe... Maybe I can invent a better one. And maybe you can, because nobody knows the ultimate. But to, up to today, from the time of Newton, no one has invented another theoretical description of the mathematical machinery behind this law, which does anything else but say the same thing over again or make the mathematics harder, and at the same time doesn't produce some wrong phenomenon. I mean, they have, like this model does it, but it produces something which isn't true. So there is no model of the theory of gravitation today other than the mathematical form. If this were the only law of this character, it would, not be, it would be interesting and rather annoying. But what turns out to be true is that the more we investigate and the more laws we find and the deeper we penetrate nature, this disease that every one of our laws is a purely mathematical statement in rather complex and abstruse mathematics, this is relatively simple mathematics, it gets more and more abstruse and more and more difficult as mathematics. And why? I haven't the slightest idea why. It is only my purpose in this lecture to tell you about this fact. In other words, it's my purpose in this lecture to explain, really, why I cannot satisfy you, if you do not understand mathematics too well, in trying to explain nature in any other way. It is the burden of this lecture, in fact, to just tell you the fact that it is impossible to answer, the, really, the, honestly, the challenge of explaining in a way that a person can feel the beauties of the laws of nature without their having some deep understanding of mathematics. I'm sorry, but it seems to be the case. You might say, all right, then there's no explanation of the law. At least tell me what the law is. Why not tell me in words instead of in the symbols? Mathematics is just a language, and I ought to be able to translate the language. And in fact, I can. And with patience, I think I partly did. I could go a little further and explain more detail that this means that if it's twice as far away, the force is one-fourth as much, and so on, and can convert all these into words. I would be, in other words, kind to the layman, as they all sit, hopefully, that you will explain them. And various different people uh, get different reputations for their skill at explaining to the layman, in la layman's language, these difficult and abstruse subjects. The layman then searches for book after book with the hope <laughs> that he will avoid the complexity that would ultimately set in even by the best expositor of this type. He reads the things hoping that one after he finds, as he reads, a generally increased confusion, one complicated statement after the other, one difficult to understand thing after the other, all apparently disconnected from one another, and it becomes a little obscure and he hopes it may be in some other book there's some explanation which avoids, which, I mean, the man almost made it, you see. Maybe another fellow makes it right. And I don't think it's possible because there's another feature. Mathematics is not just a language. Mathematics is a language plus reasoning. It's like a language plus logic. It's a, mathematics is a tool for reasoning. It's, in fact, a big collection of the results of some person's careful thought and reasoning. By mathematics, it is possible to connect one statement to another. For instance, I can say that the force is directed toward the sun. I can also tell you, as I did before, that the planet moves so that if I draw a line from the sun to the planet and draw another one at some definite period, like three weeks later, the area that's swung out by the planet is exactly the same as it will be in the next three weeks and the next three weeks and so on as it goes around the sun. Now, I can explain both of those statements to you carefully, but I cannot explain why they're both the same. 
so that if you don't appreciate the mathematics, and the, you cannot see that the great variety of facts, the enormous apparent complexity of nature with all its funny laws and rules, each of which have been carefully explained to you, are really very closely interwoven. That logic permits you to go from one up to the other. It may be unbelievable that I can demonstrate that equal times will be swept out if the forces are directed toward the sun. And just to, if I may try, I will show you one demonstration to show you that those two things really are equivalent. And so that you can appreciate that there's more to merely the statement of the two laws, that the two laws are connected such that reasoning alone will bring you from one to the other. And the mathematics is disorganized reasoning and that it's good to know how to do that that they will appreciate the beauty of the relationship of the statement. So I'm going to prove, if I may, the relationship that if the forces are directed toward the sun, that the equal areas are swept out in equal time. So we start, here's the sun, and we imagine that at a certain time, let's say the planet is here. And is moving in such a way that, let's say, one second later or one hour, pick any time, let's say one second later, it's moved in such a manner that it has gotten to the position two. Now, if the sun did not exert any force on it, then by Galileo's principle, it would keep right on going in a straight line. So in the same interval of time, later, the next second, it'll move exactly the same distance in the same straight line to the position three, were there no force. All right, now first we're going to show that if there's no force, equal areas are swept out in equal time. I remind you that the area of a triangle is half the base times the altitude, and that the altitude is the vertical distance to the base, and that if the, out, if the triangle is sort of cockeyed, there's a name for it which I forget, obtuse, obtuse, <laughs> then the altitude is this vertical height here. See, I know about the triangles, I just don't know the names. Now let us draw the lines to these two points in the case that there was no motion whatsoever. The question, this doesn't draw very well, I'm not accurate. But these two distances are equal, remember. The question is, are these two areas equal? Well, consider the triangle made from the sun and the two points one and two. It's this one. What's its area? It's this space multiplied by this height. And what about the other triangle, which is the triangle in motion from two to three? It's this base times the same altitude. The two triangles have the same altitude and, as I indicated, the same base and have the same area. So, so far, so good. If there were no force from the sun, equal areas would be swept out in equal times. The two triangles have equal areas. But there is a force from the sun. And during this interval, from one to two to three, the sun is pulling and changing the motion in various directions, this way, this way, that way. To get a good approximation to that, we'll take the central position or average position here and say that the whole effect during this interval was to change the motion by some amount in this direction toward the sun. That means that although the particles were moving this way and would have moved this way in the next second, because of the influence of the sun, the motion is altered by an amount that's poking in this direction that's parallel to this, exactly parallel. These lines are parallel. It's the direction in which this New motion, the new motion is a compound of what it wanted to do and the change that's been induced by the action of the sun. So it doesn't really end up at position three, but rather at position four. So now we would like to compare, it's getting complicated in the diagram, the triangle 24S and 23S. I'll show you that those are equal. Because they have the same base, those two triangles, this one here, and the one that happened when we had no force. The one with force and with no force have the same base. And do they have the same altitude? Sure, because they're included between parallel lines, and so they, they have the same altitude. And thus the area of the last triangle I drew is the same as the second one I drew, this one, two, three, and that I had proved earlier was the same as the first one. So in the actual or orbital motion of the planet, the area of the first in the first in second and in the second second are equal. So by reasoning, we can see a connection between the force, the fact that the force is toward the sun and that the areas are equal. Not ingenious, no. This was, uh, I borrowed this from Newton. It comes right out of the Principia, diagram and all. The letters are different, that's all, because he wrote in Latin. <laughs> These are Arabic numerals.